Recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to our Working From Home webinar series. This is number six in the series, and today we're going to be talking about hydrophobic surface treatments. Thank you for joining us. My name is Edward Hughes. I'm the CEO of Aculon. I'm joined on this webinar with me is my colleague, Mary Gattuso, who is the Senior Business Development Manager. From a logistical perspective, the webinar will be recorded. Uh, copies of the slides we've made available to you afterwards. Uh, feel free to ask any questions by going to the GoToMeeting question tab. And later today, possibly tomorrow morning, we will be sending an email to all registrants, uh, giving links to the recording and to the uh, presentation itself. So again, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. We hope that everybody is well and that they're safe. Uh, like you, I'm sure we've been surprised by this pandemic in terms of the scope, the speed, and the stakes. Uh, but we've also been pleasantly surprised by the ability for people to adapt, uh, whether it's our company, where we have about 40% of our team uh, working from home, or whether it's our customers who are continuing to work uh, from home, even if some of their businesses are closed. Aculon as a company is a, an essential company, uh, so we have remained open through this pandemic. Uh, we have continued to supply our customers on time and in full, uh, and, but we wanted to take this time to basically do a little bit more of an educational webinar series uh, so that you know that we're there for you when we come out of this, and if we can help you, that would be fantastic. Our goal as a company is to enable customers to make better products by being innovative, responsive, and fast developer and producer of best-in-class surface modification technologies. We believe together we can create winning products. During this brief webinar, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of Aculon for those of you who are not familiar with us. Talk a little bit about some of the technology platforms we have and surface modification options, but really focus in on hydrophobic applications. We're going to take a slice across multiple industries uh, today where we look at different applications. Uh, so hopefully some of these may resonate with you. They may trigger a thought around uh, the surface that you're looking to modify. Uh, so we're going to give you some examples of the things we do. We'll talk a little bit about how we work with companies in terms of testing and qualification from a lab services perspective. Uh, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So please you know, type those questions into the question box and we'll get to them as soon as we can. As a company, we are involved in many different industries. Uh, we take our surface modification across a broad variety of spaces as you can see indicated by these photographs. Our business was founded in 2004, uh, and we've developed an expertise that really is all around developing and producing surface solutions to modify a broad variety of surfaces, whether it's metals, glass, or polymers. Uh, we uh, can create different functionalities on those surfaces. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about hydrophobic. Uh, we can do super hydrophobic, oleophobic, hydrophilic, anti-fingerprinting, and even adhesion promotion. All our treatments are thin. They are easy to apply. Uh, we don't do any vacuum chamber deposition work. Uh, often no cure is required. They are safe, they are non-toxic, and we offer a variety of green options as well. We differentiate ourselves not only by creating proprietary innovative treatments, but this a willingness to work with customers to solve problems. We believe that if we work with you to help you solve the problem, then you know, together we'll help you create a better product. We've organized our business into three core focus areas, electronics, oil and gas, and specialty, which, which includes a number of things, uh, including medical. And our business model is Primarily, we produce chemistry. Uh, we work with people uh, to test and qualify parts, and we'll treat some parts, uh, but the vast majority of our businesses, we ship chemistry uh, to our customers or to their contract manufacturers uh, for them to basically apply our treatments uh, to their products. Uh, we've over 35 patents. We've worked on thousands of applications. We've invested hundreds of thousands of hours becoming surface modification experts. We've created over 100 products. Our people are smart. They are numerous chemists uh, with PhDs and master's degrees. We have several electrical, electrical and mechanical engineers as well. Uh, we're based in San Diego. Uh, that's our headquarters. 
uh, uh, where our lab and our manufacturing facility is. Uh, we have offices in Shanghai, Singapore, Dallas, Amsterdam, uh, and in Asia, we have uh, a number of distributors to help support those marketplaces. So why do hydrophobic surfaces matter? Well, what we've seen is interaction with surfaces can create problems. Hydrophobic technologies can be used to address those, and I'll give you a list of 10 different uh, examples where hopefully some of this may resonate with you. Uh, so it could be a functional issue due to a liquid behavior on the surface that you're trying to resolve. It could be a cleaning issue where maybe it's uh, too time consuming or too expensive or even impossible to clean the surface and you want that surface to stay clean. It could be a surface contamination issue where you've got fingerprints or something like that could degrade the aesthetic behavior and the looks of uh, the product you spent a long time designing. It could be that water droplets uh, or other contaminations impede optical performance if you're looking for optics uh, and sapphire lenses and those types of things. It could be uh, adhesive materials stick to the surface and you want those edges to stay sharp. <coughs> it could be that the surface is not lubricious enough. Uh, it could be that basically you know you want to change the wettability of a surface or a powder because you're not getting the performance you need. Or it could be that you've got exposure to water results in electronics failing. Uh, and then finally, you know, maybe if you need a physical barrier uh, to prevent liquid flow, but you know the physical barrier is not possible. So <laughs> when the company started, uh, we started really with a technology which is self-assembled monolayer phosphonates, or SAMPs as we call it. Um, and that's a pretty flexible uh, technology where we're basically creating uh, bonding a phosphonic acid into the surface. Uh, it's a covalent bond and then functionalizing the tail to basically, you know, repel oils or water. Uh, very thin, five nanometers uh, in uh, thickness. And that technology gave us a pretty good variety of opportunities to go after um, because the hook and tail strategy essentially allowed us to functionalize this uh, to meet whatever the customer's requirements are. But when, when we started doing the surface modification, we found that customers had a lot of uh, requirements and pretty broad uh, base requirements. And so over the years, we have built a suite of surface modification platforms uh, that basically address uh, their requirements. And so in many cases, when we talk to customers, we talk about what their needs are and try and understand it. And then our chemists and scientists basically work to figure out which uh, technology works the best. So in doing so, we've developed a series of platforms uh, all around this concept of surface modification. Today, we're going to talk about hydrophobic uh, treatments, but we've got adhesion promotion, water barrier, oleophobic, particle, anti-fingerprinting, and even hydrophilic treatments as well. So we have this pretty big uh, set of platforms that we use to modify surfaces. Uh, but when we talk about hydrophobic, um, you know, we are able to modify a pretty broad variety of surfaces uh, where obviously the goal is you're changing the surface energy such that it repels water and other liquids. Uh, we measure hydrophobicity when it's above 100 degrees and if it's super hydrophobic above 120 degrees. And that, that's water contact angle measurements. Uh, our treatments are very thin. Uh, they're optically clear, so they leave... Uh, they don't change the surface appearance uh, and you know, they leave the feel intact. Uh, and as I say, it's pretty flexible in terms of the substrate. So when we talk about hydrophobic modification, we look at two broad categories of substrates, metals and oxide containing surfaces, which could be ceramics, semiconductors, glass. And then we have a suite of technologies available to modify that. The second broad group of substrates basically we match to is polymeric ones, so polymers, uh, and we have several options there, and we also have an ability to functionalize uh, some of those surfaces so that we can use other treatments as well. But those are the two, two broad, great, uh, big kind of buckets of surfaces that we, we deal with. Uh, when we talk about durability, uh, there's a variety of different durability. Durability means different things to different people. Uh, so it could be thermal stability, uh, it could be abrasion resistance, in which case we have some treatments that are designed to be uh, very abrasion resistant because they've got strong covalent bonding, uh, and they're basically as good as that underlying substrate. If you have a good substrate uh, that, you know, uh, for example, stainless steel is a good stable substrate versus cold rolled steel is not because it's got a spoiling oxide on it, uh, then basically, you know, we're as good as that underlying substrate. Uh, 
obviously in some cases when we think about electronics you're not looking for abrasion when you're talking about treating it putting it on surf on a circuit board uh, so again you know durability is really dependent on what the application is on what the uh, the treatment is going to see uh, but we do have thermally stable ones abrasion resistant ones chemically stable ones uh, the one area we don't really do much is is uh, uv stability uh, so if you're looking for applications for outside of a building or something like that then probably you know we we wouldn't be the uh, preferred uh, supplier of choice for that uh, so uh, but for the other areas you know we uh, we offer a variety of options uh, that hopefully can uh, meet your requirements uh, from an application standpoint, uh, you're probably wondering is how do I apply this treatment? Um, it's pretty flexible. Uh, so uh, these are robust and scalable for high volume manufacturing uh, uh, lines. Uh, they are all wet chemical processes, uh, which means you know, no deposition chambers or equipment uh, or no batch processing. Um, and how the method of application can can vary depending on what you're looking to do and, and in case sometimes based on the treatment but it could be dip applied it could be spray applied it could be wipe it could be dispensed or jet uh, and we work with you to uh, dial in the parameters so that we get the optimal treatment for you whether it's in terms of concentration in terms of solvent um, in terms of how much coverage you're looking in terms of the thickness of that uh, and also whether you need a, a cure or not need a cure on that so uh, but, you know, pretty broad variety of uh, application methodologies, uh, all of which are, you know, scalable to la large quantities and, and fast applications. So let me now switch and give you a little bit of uh, uh, some of the areas that we deal with. Uh, as I say, we are organized by electronics, oil and gas uh, specialty. Uh, in electronics, we have a number of different products out there. We have our NanoClear product, uh, which is for stencils. We have NanoProof, a series of products uh, that is designed to basically create a moisture and, and protect circuit boards. Uh, we have anti-fingerprinting. We have some uh, semiconductor type applications as well. Um, this is an example of our, of our NanoClear. This is the package on the right-hand side. It's a two-part wipe. Part A is a, is a primer, uh, and then part B is actually the uh, treatment in and of itself. Uh, we have sold hundreds of thousands of these over the years, uh, and it's an extremely thin flux repellent uh, treatment that you apply to the underside of a stencil in an SMT process. Uh, and the goal and what it delivers for you is it basically helps you improve your quality. You get higher yields because you get less uh, rejects uh, through this. Uh, you get better transfer effectiveness. Uh, you basically boost your productivity because you are reducing the number of under uh, stencil wipes. Uh, so that basically gives you an increase in throughput because uh, you've got more uptime uh, and you obviously got less paper changes as well. Uh, and it saves you money, a significant amount of money, because there's less rework of those boards uh, and you've got lower paper and, and solvent consumption as well. So uh, that product won a number of awards when it first came out. Uh, it has been the uh, feature of many articles uh, across that uh, SMT industry, uh, including several cover covers uh, that basically uh, talk about the benefits of doing that. And as such, it's become pretty broadly adopted. It's the number one global uh, uh, product in that marketplace. Uh, it's not just for fine pitch stencils. It basically makes every uh, stencil print better. Uh, so it solves a lot of problems for people. Uh, so it's a very good product uh, and it's been very well established. Uh, Anti-fingerprinting technologies. Uh, here's some examples. It could be on laptops. Uh, it could be on uh, home appliances. It could be on packaging. Now, this is a relatively newer area for us, uh, but as people spend a lot of time getting their designs and aesthetics right, uh, it becomes important that it's not that they're ruined by you know fingerprints getting onto the surfaces. Uh, and we basically have the ability to put optically you know, clear, very thin uh, treatments on that significantly reduce the visibility uh, of the fingerprint. Uh, and it doesn't eliminate it entirely, uh, but it probably reduces it by 65 to 80%. Uh, and we also basically give the functionality that makes it easy to clean. Uh, you know, grease and other things beat up on that surface, and so it just can be wiped clean. So it, uh, things don't smear across that. Uh, that's a durable product that can last a, a long time. Uh, when it comes to waterproofing, we've all got electronic devices, whether it's automobiles, appliances, uh, you know, 
consumer electronics or even stuff that we do uh, for uh, medical device companies in operating rooms where, where water can basically get uh, into those devices uh, and basically damage those devices. So in this case, you're looking for a hydrophobic treatment to essentially waterproof the device to prevent it from you know, failing. So we developed a series of products uh, that uh, was launched back, I think, in 2016 um, to actually 2012 uh, to basically you know, prevent a water ingress into a device uh, and to protect it. And it could be all the way from uh, humidity protection to full water immersion. So not every device is going to see full water immersion. So in many cases, uh, they may be looking for something that's just protecting from water splashing. Uh, those type of things. Uh, and there's an IPX scale that basically rates the degree of waterproofing you need to have. So we like to work with customers to understand what is it you are trying to do because not everybody is building a submarine, right? Uh, so you are building you know, products that basically meet the functionality of that marketplace. So over the years, we've basically built a technology roadmap uh, that has increased its performance over time. Uh, and so we've now got a, a number of series of products here that basically, as you can see, is increasing in performance. Uh, and we've added some interesting features. So some of them have push through connectivity. If you were trying to collect the, to connect the display to the, to the board, et cetera, then you, know, you can push through post application, which is a big deal because in, if you're doing vacuum deposition treatments, you're gonna have to mask and, it, and it's, it's kind of a problematic way to go. Uh, others are flexible, as you all know, circuitry is becoming more flexible, uh, and so you need to be able to, the, the coating needs to be uh, not crack, right, uh, but bend as the circuit is, uh, as the circuit board is flexed. Uh, and we have some green VOC exempt options where basically we are not uh, uh, creating uh, you know, photochemical reactions uh, and creating photochemical smog. So, uh, these products uh, can give you different levels of IPX performance. Again, so what we like to do is really understand what it is your requirement is for your level of waterproofing. Uh, all these products offer the ability to be done in line. Uh, they are all non-toxic. Uh, some of them have this push through connectivity. So you need to tell us that up front if that is an important feature for you. Uh, again, if flexibility is an important feature for you, uh, we have some options. And if you are looking for green or VOC exempt options, you know, we can provide those as well. Um, and what we're hoping to obviously do is to reduce you know, damage to your devices uh, and lower the basic return rates. Uh, we can increase your yields because rework is possible. And in many cases, if you put a hard conformal coating down on a board, you can't rework it. So you've lost the cost of that uh, board. Uh, in most cases, no or minimal masking is required. Uh, in all cases, they're safe, non-toxic, can be used in the fa factory environment, and that they are affordable. Uh, the coating process is going to depend a little bit on the treatment. Um, <clears throat> so we have spray options, we have jet dispense options, we have dip options. Uh, but one thing we, uh, we offer to everybody is basically an ability to inspect this because obviously you're going to want to see, uh, did my board, did my you know, circuit actually get coated? So they'll contain UV traces uh, in that. So you can do that, whether it's as simple as a handheld device you can see on the right hand side or, or more of a automated UV inspection equipment. Um, oil and gas. This is an interesting area for us and I feel bad for the oil and gas people at the moment. Obviously, there's a lot of turmoil going on uh, in that particular segment. Uh, but we do a couple of things. We have a partnership relating to enhanced oil recovery, uh, where we're basically increasing the volume of oil recovery from down well, uh, uh, wells. Uh, we do a number of different things in anti-fouling. It could be storage tanks, uh, where basically we are preventing the paraffin and asphaltine uh, buildups uh, in that, which, which are in crude. Uh, it could be treating oil spill containment booms, booms to basically make sure that they are uh, clean when they come back into port. Uh, and it could be something like an optical application for sapphire. Uh, in our specialty business, as I said at the start, we do a pretty broad collection of things uh, from medical devices to, you know, uh, consumer electronics to, to uh, consumer goods uh, to movie screens, a number of different things. So in medical devices, it could be needles or syringes. Uh, it could be uh, electronic devices, as I say, in operating rooms, uh, wet working conditions, uh, and you want to basically eliminate failure. It could be uh, metals and stents or guide wires. Uh, and it could be other uh, meshes and screens. So uh, a lot of different things we can do that uh, provide functionality 
uh, to those applications. Uh, in optics, uh, sapphire is an area, sapphire is a really good substrate, a very durable substrate, uh, but it can get, you know, the, uh, if you're measuring using this as a part of a sensor, if you've got water or oil getting splashed on it, et cetera, uh, it can create problems. And so we treat the sapphire uh, <laughs> so that the uh, basically sapphire and the optics stay clean. Uh, we also treat particles. Uh, here you are looking for a basically trying to change that surface energy to get to the optimal uh, surface conditions for the performance you are looking for. Uh, we do this in a bulk format. Uh, it's a scalable process, uh, so we can functionalize these particles and make these particles hydrophobic uh, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, so a pretty interesting uh, area that we work on there. Now, in terms of how we work with customers, uh, we really want to help you hit the target as fast as possible. We don't believe in just throwing it over the fence and send you some samples and say, good luck, uh, try, try, and, uh, try it out yourselves and see how that works. Uh, we would rather you know, go through a bit more diligent process to make sure that we are helping you get to what you need. So we spend a lot of time understanding the customer requirements up front. We need to know what you are trying to do, what that substrate is going to see, uh, what issues you are having, what's causing you performance problems today. We then evaluate, okay, can we help you? Uh, now we understand what the requirements are. Can our lab support you and help you do that? Uh, so that we'll treat parts, we'll analyze, we'll characterize those parts, we'll test to see whether we, whether we got the functionality you're looking to do. We'll send those parts back to you. Uh, the customer then tests them. They provide feedback. They provide iterations. They say, no, we need this is good, but this needs to be tweaked a little bit, et cetera. So we'll go through a process to try and optimize that for you. At the end of that, we'll have a selection and a recommendation on, of what the best way to treat your parts are. And then hopefully that then goes into a plant trial and a larger scale. Uh, and if we've done our job right, uh, we get you to hit the target, right? And hopefully we get you to hit a bullseye. So that's our process. As I say, it's, uh, some, some of the other people in this industry will prefer just send you samples and kind of with a good luck ticket. Uh, uh, we like to be a little bit more diligent around that. Um, and so we're, we're selective with the people that we work with because we want to make sure that we're helping them hit the target, not just throwing stuff up against the wall. Uh, from an IP standpoint, uh, I say we've got a good combination of hard and soft IP. We've got uh, our patent wall of fame for over 35 patents. Uh, we've got a number of trade secrets. Uh, we have tested thousands of applications. Uh, so our knowledge base inside the team is, is pretty impressive. Uh, we've got a terrific partnership with UCSD, University of California, San Diego, uh, that gives us access to millions of dollars of you know, good university testing equipment in addition to what we have in our own facility, which you can see on the right hand side. And we've spent hundreds of thousands of hours solving surface problems. So, I mean, again, we've built up this, this huge capability, invested millions of dollars uh, to basically uh, be able to help solve problems. Uh, sustainability is an area that we take seriously and a lot of our customers are taking seriously and you know, increasing the requirements. Uh, so we want to be an environmentally friendly product company. Uh, we want to have good sustainable business practices. Uh, we want to help our customers support their sustainability goals, whether it's having VOZ exempt options, PFOA free products, whether it's eco packaging, uh, you know, obviously efficient transportation, and even in our facilities ourselves, we use sustainable energy, LED lighting, uh, and basically, you know, try to be a good, you know, community citizen and a good uh, steward of the planet as well. So let me finish with our conclusion. So as you hopefully you've seen from this, we're a platform technology company that makes customers' products better. That's what we do. Our goal is to help you make your products better. We do that by being surface solution experts, uh, we have a long history of working with customers to solve problems. We've got a broad portfolio of products, including a number of sustainable options, and we have strong IP, great testing uh, capabilities, and great in-house uh, capabilities. So uh, uh, with that, uh, I'm going to take a look and see if there's any questions here. So uh, if you can uh, fill out any questions, that would be, uh, that would be terrific. All right, I can see there's, there's a bunch. All right, uh, okay. I'm a manufacturer of underwater camera housings for action sports photographers based in San Diego. Well, we're based in San Diego, so once we get out of this situation, come by and see us. Uh, the lens through acrylic uh, surface images, we need water droplets to be non-existent. Acrylic has been difficult to treat. Uh, okay, so I guess this question is, yeah, 
does your treatment work on acrylic? And I'm going to throw that one to Mario. Yes, actually. So we face uh, this similar application, um, actually treating acrylic domes for security camera covers. Um, and so somewhat counterintuitively, what you actually want is a hydrophilic treatment. Um, something that's going to, rather than cause the water to beat up, which is then going to have um, optical impacts, you actually want something that's going to allow the allow the water to form a nice uniform film across the surface of the of the um, the acrylic dome. So we can help uh, put down a hydrophilic uh, durable coating that achieves that result. Um, and I believe we're holding a hydrophilic webinar in. Uh, two weeks. Uh, check the email that you responded to, but we are holding a hydrophilic webinar, um, I believe, in two weeks' time that'll cover that topic. Okay. So, and uh, this was from Mike. So, just uh, Mike, uh, reach out to us, and ho hopefully, uh, <clears throat> we'll be able to meet with you soon. Uh, Somebody is asking about the organometallic, which organometallic is used for this purpose. Uh, I think we keep our uh, details of our formulations uh, proprietary, so I'm going to skip on that one. Uh, my another question my problem is condensation on treated surfaces in high humidity due to nucleation sites what solutions are available i'm going to throw that with you mario uh so again it depends on how you want the water to behave on the surface my i can get some of the more uh, experienced technical folks involved but my understanding is that a hydrophobic or a hydrophilic treatment is not going to present, prevent condensation or crystal formation on your surface. It's just going to alter how it behaves. So if you have a hydrophobic or hydro, super hydrophobic surface, you're going to get fogging and water droplet formation. Whereas if you have a hydrophilic surface, you're going to get water um, wanting to more wet and spread out on the surface. Okay. Uh, another one for you, Mary. Would any of your products be a safer alternative to household waterproofing sprays like Scotchgard? Um, so in terms of, I suppose it depends somewhat on what, what, the, what they mean by safe, if they're referring to flammable or uh, chemical um, uh, concerns, but we have a wide variety of options. We have options that are um, that are non-flammable um, and are, and are uh, non-VOC. Um, we also have options that are flammable and VOC, depending on the local regulations. Um, but most importantly, all of our coatings um, are, have a health rating of zero. We do not sell any coatings that are considered uh, hazardous from a health perspective, um, you know, assuming that people are smart enough not to, uh, not to consume them. Um, so, from a health perspective, uh, all of our coatings are, are good options, and from a flammability perspective, we have non-flammable options. Okay, uh, there's a question, does the coating have good impact resistance? We have a pretty broad variety of coatings, so if you are certain things like uh, treatments on metal, as I say, we're as good as the underlying substrate. So if you uh, damage or tear away the underlying substrate, then uh, you are basically going to be tearing away the treatment. I mean, those are less than five nanometers thick, so they're not adding to impact resistance, uh, but they are very, very good. They're not brittle. They they don't crack. They don't flake. Um, so yeah, again, it's, it's going to depend a little bit on the substrate, but uh, you're as good as the underlying substrate. Um, then there's a question, what is the lower temperature limit for the coating? Uh, Mara, you can answer that. Obviously, we have a lot of coatings, but uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, one which specifically, but maybe Mara, you've got a view. Yeah, so in general, our coatings don't have a known lower temperature limit. Usually, that's uh, an issue for thicker, more traditional uh, coatings, which are cross-linking um, and are have uh, internal covalent bonding um, where when you get down to low temperatures they get below their TG, they get brittle and they can potentially crack um, and fail. Um, majority of our coatings are, are mono are mono layers in a different form of technology. Um, so we, we do not have a known um, uh, lower temperature uh, threshold. So for low temperature applications uh, our technologies are phenomenal options and will not exhibit the types of failure you would see with a traditional coating. 
Okay. Um, next question is, can your coding show durability for 30 to 35 years? I don't know if we've ever tested anything for 30 to 35 years. Uh, so as I say, if you are looking at uh, the coatings are stable once they are on the surface. They don't degrade by themselves. Uh, they will degrade if you're exposing them to UV or something like that. Um, so we'd have to have more details on this specific application to give you a, a definitive answer on on that. But you know the coatings by themselves uh, don't degrade. Uh, Mara, I'm going to give you this one. Can you treat plastics to be hydrophobic in electrolytic solution? But if current applied become hydrophilic, wow, that's an interesting question. That is an interesting question, and I'm not even going to pretend that I know how to answer it. I've not come across that application, and that's definitely um, one to get our higher level um, PhDs in on. Um, it sounds really interesting, and I'd love to learn more about the application. So I'd encourage whoever asked that to reach out to us. Okay, uh, so the lady that asked about, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, 30, 35 years says it's ceramic materials. She wants to wants to test this. Uh, so yeah, reach out to us uh, on that. Uh, Mario, you've done some work with different ceramic materials, and uh, maybe you can address the durability. Yes, ceramic is a great substrate for us to treat. Ceramic is really robust, um, and we have a saying that our our treatments from a durability or an abrasion perspective are as robust as the underlying substrate so it's a, it's a great start for us um and so really it ultimately depends not so much on the, t the amount of time but what what is the treated part going to be exposed to over the course of that 30 35 years as you can imagine there's a wide variety of exposure conditions it could be really benign or it could be a really aggressive environment and that's going to have a, a very significant impact on, on how we're able to achieve that Okay. Um, someone's asking about our oil and gas application down well to reduce uh, water production. <laughs> yeah, so what we're trying to do obviously there is preferentially uh, increase the flow of oil over water. Obviously, uh, that's a, a goal for a lot of people. They'd like to be pumping more oil and water, uh, and so we have a treatment to, uh, that, does, to, that does that. Uh, what what is the typical coating service life? Uh, not sure I understand the question. Mary, do you want to? Yeah, I, I think I think that's a similar question to the individual that was asking about the thirty to thirty five year lifetime. Um, so the the typical, assuming you're asking about the lifetime of the coating, again, it's going to depend on a bunch of factors. It's going to depend on um, which technology we're using. It's going to depend on what the substrate is, it's gonna depend on the exposure conditions. Um, so we can talk to you about all of those things. The substrate, what your performance requirements are, which is gonna kind of drive which technology we go with and what is that coded part being exposed to. And that's really gonna drive um, what sort of performance you see and what sort of lifetime you can reasonably expect. And you know, there's a huge gamut there's a, you know, you could have um, coatings that, you know, are really just one-offs, are, are only meant to be used one time over the course of a few hours, and then we have coatings that could be surviving for, you know, decades plus. Um, so it's, it's very much application specific, so we're happy to talk to you about your application and let you know what we think we can do. Okay, and we've got uh, one last question, we're a little bit over on time. Uh, any delamination issues? I'll handle that one. So again, this is going back to the stability at low temperatures. So because our coatings are not your traditional cross-linked, say epoxy or acrylic, these are monolayers, um, some proprietary organometallics. We're primarily um, monolayer, um, monolayer bonding. And so due to the makeup of these coatings, um, a delamination, as you would uh, traditionally think of it, is not actually possible. Um, so delamination is uh, not an issue nor a concern. Okay, great. Well, there's a few more questions coming in, but uh, we're kind of uh, at that uh, point of time. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. I hope this was helpful. Uh, I hope you are staying safe and you are well. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, 
you'll get an email from us uh, later today or tomorrow morning. Uh, please respond to that and we'll try and address uh, those questions. Uh, hopefully this has uh, uh, sparked some interest on your part and we uh, look forward to working with you. So again, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we appreciate uh, you listening to our Working From Home webinar series. So with that, thank you and we'll wrap it up.